Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Second session from Zad al-Mustaqna, uh, Kitab al-Hajj, the book of Hajj. Um, last week, we were speaking about the issues pertaining, or we ended up speaking about the issues pertaining to the qudra, to the ability that one is required to, to have in order for Hajj to be obligatory upon them. So Imam al-Hajjawi, rahmatullah alayhi, he stopped at the, we stopped with him at the statement where he said, وَإِنْ أَعْجَزَهُ kibarun." If a person is unable to perform Hajj due to old age, very old age, and weakness that accompanies that old age, أَوْ مَرَضٌ لَا يُرْجَى بُرْؤُهُ أَوْ due to an illness that it's not perceived that he will be cured from it. It's a terminal type of illness and it's not perceived that he will be cured from it. Then it becomes imperative for this person that he finds somebody who will do Hajj on his behalf. So if the person is too old, the person is too sick, a sickness which is uh, perceived that it won't be cured, a long-term illness, then this person, it's imperative that he finds somebody to do Hajj as a replacement for him. So the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim is an evidence for this. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said, جاءت امرأة من خعثما آم الحجة الوضع قالت يا رسول الله A woman came from this place, خعثم, and she said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّ فَرِيدَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَىٰ إِبَادِهِ فِي الْحَجِّ أَدْرَكَتْ أَبِي شَيْخًا كَبِيرًا لَا يَسْتَطْرِيُ أَنْ يَسْتَوِيَ عَلَىٰ الرَّاحِلَ that verily my father has become old in Islam and the obligation of Hajj is now upon him. However, he's too old and he's unable to sit upon a riding beast. So is it permissible and will it be valid that I make Hajj in place of him? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Naam, yes, go ahead and do that. And also we have the Hadith in Abi Dawood, which is alluding to the similar point in Abi uh, Abi Razin radiallahu anhu, he said, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, inni uh, inna abi shaykhun kabirun la yastatiyu al-hajja wa la al-umrata wa la da'an. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, verily my father has reached a very old age. He's unable to do hajj, nor is he able to do umrah, and nor is he able to travel. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ihjuj an abika wa'tamir. Make Hajj on behalf of your father and also make the Umrah on behalf of your father. So Sheikh Mansur, he says, فَمَنْ عَجِزَ عَنِ الْحَجْبِ بِبَدْنِهِ وَقَدِرَ بِمَالِهِ وَلَمْ يُرْجَ بُرْهُ فَيَلْزِمُهُ أَنْ يُقِيمَ عَنْهُ مَنْ يَحَجْ وَيَأْتَمِرْ So he says that whoever, which is the situation of old age where he's unable to do Hajj or he has an illness which is unlikely to be cured, but this person has the ability to pay with his wealth that somebody can do Hajj on his behalf and Umrah on his behalf, then this is something that he must do. However, what's imperative when you are having a substitute doing a Hajj on your behalf, that this person should have the intention and this person should know that he's doing it on behalf of you. Whether the person is being paid to do this Hajj on your behalf or the person is doing it of his own voluntary will without any financial aid from yourself, then it's still imperative that um, the one that he is doing it on behalf of has the intention and uh, is aware that this person is doing Hajj for him. If it's a situation where the person has decided to do Hajj as a replacement for the one who's sick or the one who's too old, but he did not inform that person who is sick or too old, then this Hajj is not valid for the one who is sick or too old. Rather, it will be a voluntary Hajj for the one who is the replacement. Sheikh Abdul Salam al he mentioned some conditions for the validity of one being a replacement in the Hajj. So he says um, that in order for somebody to be a replacement for you in Hajj, if you fit the category of being too old or having a sickness which is uh, unlikely to be cured, may Allah protect us from that, he said then it must be a person whose Hajj is valid in of themselves. 
meaning that the person fits into the category of whom they are able to perform Hajj in a valid Sharia sense. So a question to yourselves then, who does this exclude? If we say that the condition is that the person has to be one who is, it's valid for him to make Hajj, then who does this exclude? Question to yourselves, who does this then exclude? Tayyib. This then will exclude, for example, the slave, because the slave, it, for him to make Hajj, it's not valid, right? It would also exclude the one who is a child. It would exclude the one who has lost his mental faculties, etc., etc. Um, another condition for the Hajj to be valid or for the person to be a, a valid replacement in the Hajj is that they must have already performed Hajj, the obligatory Hajj in Islam, for themselves. If they have not performed the obligatory Hajj, for themselves, then it's not possible that they can then perform it on behalf of anybody else. So before they go ahead and volunteer, whether they volunteer and they are paid for that service, or they volunteer and they are not paid for that service, they cannot do that replacement Hajj unless they have done their own Hajj, which is obligatory upon them. Also, he says, min haythu wajiba, min haythu wajiba, meaning that when the sick person who is unlikely to be cured, or the old person who's too old and weak to do Hajj, when he wants to get a replacement for himself to do Hajj on his behalf, he has to ensure that that replacement is found in the land that he is in. So if the person is living in London, for example, or the person is living in Doha, then the replacement has to be from that resident land where he is. So if a person is living in London, he cannot then get a replacement from Doha. This is not going to be valid for him. And also, as Sheikh Abdul Salam al-Shawayr, Allah mentions, that if the person is unable to find somebody to do the replacement for him in that particular land, then it's not then obligatory upon him to have a replacement unless and until that time comes when he can find a replacement. So the condition is also that if one wants to be uh, a replacement, then it has to be from the same land wherein the person is living. This is the opinion of the madhab. Some of the Hanbali scholars, the contemporary ones who passed away recently, rahmatullah alayhim, may Allah have mercy upon them, like Shaykh Ibn Baz and Uthaymin, they said it can be from any land. They said it can be from any land. The author, he says, So this replacement person is going to be valid if it's from the same land for the sick person and for the elderly person, even, even if the sick person becomes cure from his sickness after the replacement person has entered into the state of ihram. So again, the author is saying that the replacement is valid for the one who has the excuse, the one who has a sickness which is unlikely to be cured, even if he is cured, right, miraculously by Allah's permission, after the replacement person has gone into the state of ihram. So if he becomes cured, becomes cured after that state, the hajj is still going to be valid. So Sheikh Mansour, he says in explaining this point, He's saying, Sheikh Mansour, that once you have established a person to be a replacement for you, Okay, and then you become cured after the person is a replacement for you, then this has two scenarios. The first of them, in So if the person who is the replacement, um, he, if the person who is the replacement gets to know, comes to know, that the one who was sick has now become cured and this knowledge comes to him before he gets into the state of ihram then in this situation his the hajj is not going to be valid for the one who was sick who was sick and then now became uh, cured because that excuse has been removed from him so the one who is doing the hajj if he comes to know this before he gets into the state of ihram that the one who is doing hajj on behalf of has become cured, then his hajj is not going to be valid and rather it will become a voluntary hajj for that person. 
فلا يجزئهم وتكون الحجة للنائب وعليه النفقة إن علم بالشفاء موكله أو على المنيب إن لم يعلم النائب بشفائه نعم أو the second scenario وإن برئ بعد الإحرام if the person who was sick becomes cured after the replacement person has now got into the state of ihram or any of the rituals of hajj after the ihram or بعد تحلل for example من الإحرام والفراغ منه فيجزئه so in this situation then the hajj is going to be valid as a replacement hajj because he only came to know it he only came to know about the person being cured after he had, after he had gotten into the state of ihram so once the person gets into the state of ihram and he gets to know that the person who is doing it on behalf has become cured then it doesn't matter the hajj is still going to be valid the point where it's not going to be valid if the person is cured before the replacement person gets into ihram and the replacement person has knowledge of this person being cured before getting into ihram then the hajj as a replacement is not going to be valid Dothar he moves on and he says and it's it's conditional for it to be obligatory upon a woman meaning the hajj and the umrah that she finds a mahram so for in order to the hajj and the umrah to be obligatory upon a woman it's a condition that she has a mahram in the hadith in bukhari and muslim of abu hurairah radiyallahu anhu he said that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said la yahillu li amra'atin tu'minu billahi wal yawm al akhir an tusafira masirat al yawm wa laylatin laysa ma'aha hurma that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said is not permissible is not permitted for a woman who believes in allah and the last day that she undertakes a journey the length of a day and a night unless she has a mahram with her if she doesn't have a mahram it's not permissible for her to take this journey and also in the hadith in Bukhari in Muslim, one of the companions, he came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, uh, kada wa kada. This man, this companion, radiallahu anhu, he came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I have signed myself up in a particular battle. I've been conscripted in a particular battle. And my wife, she has gone out with a group of companions not related to her to make hajj so the prophet sallallahu said idhab ma'a go leave the battle leave the army and go and make hajj with your wife sheikh mansur he says so this person had left for jihad with the prophet sallallahu whilst his wife was going on a hajj with a group of women and the men that were in that group, they were from the best of creation after the prophets, meaning from the companions of the Allah who were the most trustworthy of people to be with as, as, as a traveling companion and in other matters, more trustworthy than anybody else after the prophets of Allah. And even having all of this in mind, the Prophet ﷺ still commanded the man to leave the jihad and to go and be accompanying his wife, showing how important it is for a woman to have a mahram when she wants to travel. No matter how good her companions are, how uh, virtuous they may be. Okay. Um, Sheikh Abdul Salam Shwayer, he says that if the woman, she makes the hajj without a mahram, then her hajj is going to be valid, but she's going to be sinful. So if she makes the hajj without a mahram, her hajj will be valid as a hajj in Islam, but she will be sinful for having disobeyed the command of the Prophet So who is this mahram? The author, he goes on to explain. It is a husband. Or somebody who due to relationship, the blood relationship of this woman, then this person is never able to marry her. Or he is a mahram to her due to a um, permissible uh, reason. So again, it's either the husband or it's the one who is ala ta'abid mahram laha, that this person is forever going to be a mahram for her due to, um, due to family relationships. 
or due to um, other permissible reasons. So the first of the mahrams is the zawj, is the husband, the zawj. And the word mahram, it comes from the meaning uh, of haram, right? Impermissible. So it means that the mahram is impermissible to marry to this particular woman, or it's impermissible for the woman to marry this particular male relative. However, with the zawj, you notice that obviously it's not impermissible for the husband to marry the wife because he's married with her. So then why does it share the name mahram with the meaning of haram? It rather has the meaning that this man that she is married to is there to protect, protect her hurma, to protect her sanctity and her nobility. That's the meaning that it shares uh, with zawj, with husband. And also, man tahrum alayhi ala ta'bi bin nasab. So also we said that the uh, mahram is those people who due to relationships with the, with the woman, they are forever forbidden to marry her. So who are these people? The first of them is Al-Ab, wa in ala is the father and ascendingly. So the father, the grandfather, the great-grandfather, all of these, it's forbidden, obviously, for the woman to marry. Wal ibn wa in nazad and for the, and for the uh, son, and even if it goes down, okay? Uh, the son and his sons, uh, so that would be the grandson and then the great grandson example. Al Akh, the brother, it's impermissible for her to marry her brother. Therefore, he is also a mahram. Al Am and Al Khal, the paternal uncle and the maternal uncle, it's also impermissible for her to marry. And number six and number seven, number six, Ibn Al Akh, the son of a brother is impermissible for her to marry. And Ibn al-Ukht, number seven, the son of a, of a sister is impermissible for her to, to marry. So these are nasab, uh, al-mahram, al ta'bid. Okay, this is the ones who are forever forbidden for this woman to marry. Therefore, they are mahram for a woman, forever. Um, a second category, man tahrum alayhi bi sabab al-mubah, wa yashmil al-amrayn, wa yashmil al-amrayn. And the second category is those people who due to a permissible reason that the woman is not allowed to marry, therefore they are mahram to her. These fall under two categories. The first of them, al-musahara. Al-musahara, this word, it means that somebody who has a relationship due or through marriage, through marriage to this woman, uh, this person is related to her. And the second of these categories is rada, due to being breastfed, okay, from the same breast that this woman was fed from. So the first of them we'll discuss is birada'a, the one from breastfeeding, the relationships from breastfeeding. Sheikh Mansour, he says, yahrum alayha sab'a. Seven people will be forbidden upon her to marry, okay, through breastfeeding. Wahum kal muharim bin nasab. And they are exactly the same as the seven categories that we just mentioned due to um, blood relationships. Because in the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said, يَحْرُمُوا مِنَ الرَّضَاءَ مَا يَحْرُمُوا مِنَ النَّسَبِ That it's impermissible, it's, it's haram through breastfeeding, that which is haram through relationships, through blood and family relationships. So the mahrams that are, that are there through uh, blood and family relationships are the same that are there if a person is breastfed from, uh, from the breast uh, of a person whom others have been breastfed from that same breast. So they become one family, okay? And it's the same seven category uh, that we mentioned. And also bin Musaraha, we mentioned the Musaraha is the relationships through marriage. Yahrum al this would consider four people to be her mahrum, Abu Zawjaha, it will be the father of her husband. Ibn Zawjaha, it would be the secondly, the uh, son of her husband. Thirdly, Zawju bin Tuha, it would be the husband of her daughter. And these three are mahram due to contractual, due to the marriage contracts. And fourthly, Zawju Ummuha, it would be the husband of her mother. But the Zawj Ummuha, the husband of the of her mother is not a mahram until he had, until the husband has had relationships with her mother. Once the relationship has been had, then he becomes a mahram, not just through marriage. 
So in essence, uh, like we said, with all these details, the summary of it is just to know that the woman, she cannot travel unless she has a mahram. Okay? The author, he goes on and he said, وَإِن مَاتَ مَنْ لَزِمَهُ أُخْرِجَ مِنْ تَرِكَتِهِ If a person was obligated with hajj, meaning the conditions of hajj were found upon him, he had the ability in all the situations that we described, yet he didn't go to make hajj. He was too lazy. He was too careless. He had tafrit. Okay, he couldn't be bothered to go make hajj. To this person, it's imperative that hajj is made on his behalf after he dies, right? So this person has died whilst hajj was obligatory upon him, but he couldn't be bothered or he was too lazy to go and make the hajj. He was too busy doing other affairs in the dunya. So when he's passed away, now it's looked into his wealth and before his wealth is distributed, then uh, money is taken if money is there uh, and it's to be given at, to be paid for a replacement who will make hajj on his behalf. So Sheikh Mansour says, إِذَا مَاتَ الْإِنسَانُ وَهُوَ لَمْ يَحُجْ فَلَا يَخْلُ مِنْ حَالَتَيْنِ أَنْ يَكُونُ الْحَجْ لَزِمَهُ وَوَجِبَ عَلَيْهِ لَكِنَّهُ فَرَّتَ فِي أَدَائِهِ فَيَجِبَ أَنْ يَحُجْ عَنْهُ وَيُخْرَجْ مِنْ رَأْسِ مَا لِتَرِكَتِهِ لأن هذا دين عليه, as I explained. وَيَذُلُّ لَهُ قَوْلُ النَّبِي is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where he said فَدَيْنُ اللَّهِ أَحَقُّ بِالْخَضَاءِ That the right of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, the debt which is owed to Allah Azza wa is more in need of being paid, okay? However, Sheikh Mansour says, secondly, أَنْ يَكُونُ الْحَجْ لَمْ يَجِبَ عَلَيْهِ If the hajj was not obligatory upon this person, كَمَا لَوْ كَانَ صَغِيرًا أَوْ مَرِيدًا لَمْ يَقْدِرْ مِنْ حِينَ بَلُوغِهِ عَلَى الْحَجْ فَإِنَّهُ لَا يَعْثَمْ وَلَا يُؤْمَرْ وَارِثَهُمْ بِأَنْ يَحُجْ عَنْهُ مِنْ مَالِهِ So in a situation where the hajj was not obligatory upon a person, like the person was below the age of puberty and they passed away, or the person had a, a, a terminal sickness, uh, as we said, uh, a sickness which it's not hoped that he was going to be cured from, and then he died before he could make hajj, then in this situation, it's not imperative to make to take the money from his inheritance and make hajj on his behalf. However, if somebody did it voluntarily on their behalf, then hopefully, with Allah's permission, the reward would go to that person. And also, the umrah is in the same ruling. The author, he moves on and he says, Bab al-Mawaqeet. Now he's going to talk about the Mawaqeet. Mawaqeet is the pool of Miqat. Miqat is a... Miqat is a specified amount of time or a specified place where worship is to be done. So either in a specified time or in a specified place where the worship is to be done. Istilahan, technically, it's the man al-nusuk wa maud al-ihram lahu. It's the time frame wherein the rites of hajj are to be formed, be performed, and the place where the person gets into ihram for these rites of hajj. Okay? And the author, he says, The miqat of the people of Medina is Dhul Hulayfa. Dhul Hulayfa huwa miqat ahl al-Madina wa baynahu baynah masjid al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thalat ta'ashu kilo. So this miqat, Dhul Hulayfa, between it and the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is 13 kilometers. Wa min al-miqat ila Mecca arba'amiyah wa ishreen is 420 kilometers. Wa huwa abad and it is the furthest miqat from Mecca. And it's also known as Wadi Al-Aqiq. And the general folk, now they call it Abyar. Uh, Abyar, or they call it Abar, Abar Ali. Okay, so this, this is Dhul Hulayfa, the furthest of the miqat. And again, a miqat is the place, as we said, that um, once you get to that place, before you have gotten to that place or at that place, you have to enter into the state of Ihram. The second miqat is for the Ahl al-Sham, the people of Sham and Misr, wal Maghrib, the people of Sham, Misr, and uh, Morocco, etc. It is Al-Juhfa. Al-Juhfa hiya qabiyatun qandibatun jarafatha suyul. It is the old village which was destroyed due to uh, a flood. فَخَرَبَتْ بَعْدَ مَا كَانَتْ مَحَطَّةً لِلْحُجَّادِ So it became demolished 
and destroyed after it used to be a stopping point for the Hujjaj, for the pilgrims. And they used to be in it a, a disease, a disease of some sort. When taqalat ilayha min al Medina, it came to this place, al Juhfa, from Medina. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ made dua. Walqul hummaha ila al Juhfa. In Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ, when there was fever and um, disease in Medina, the Prophet ﷺ made dua that it be moved to al Juhfa. So in any case, al Juhfa is the, um, the miqat for the people of Sham and Misr and Maghrib. And for the people of Yemen, it is the place known as Yalamlam. It is the Miqat of the people of Yemen and it's still built up and being used till now. And between it and the people of Mecca is 85 kilometers. And in it is a well. That is named Sa'diya. You call in the Hunisbatun ila Imra, Hafaratu ismuha Fatima, a Sa'diya. It's ascribed to a woman who dug this well, okay, and her name was Fatima Sa'diya. So Yalamlam is also known as uh, Sa'diya due to a well that it has in there. Wahal Najd Qarn, and for the people of Najd Qarn, Qarn al Manazi. And it's also known as Sayl al-Kabir. And it is the Miqat for the people of Najd and Ta'if. And its distance from Mecca is 78 kilos, kilometers. And the people of the East, their Miqat is that Irq. That Irq. Like the people of Iraq, Iran, Hind, and Pakistan, people of India and Pakistan, and similar to them. That Irq is a village, but now it's like kind of uh, dilapidated, it's, it's broke down, it's not in use anymore. وَهُوَ فِي مَنْطِقَةِ تُسَمَّى الضَّرِيبَ And it is an area known as Dariba. وَيُبْعَدَ الْمَكَّةِ قُرَابَ Kilo. And it is a distance from Mecca for roughly 80 kilometers. And it is for the people who live in those Miqat areas. They will go to those Miqats to get into the state of Ihram. And also it's for the people that come upon them that don't live in those Miqat areas. So whether you live in those Miqat areas, okay, you would go to that Miqat to get into the state of Ihram. And if you didn't live in those Miqat areas, then as you are traveling to that direction from, from, from wherever you are coming, you will get into the state of Miqat. This is based on the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, the hadith of Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, where the Prophet sallallahu said, وَقَّتَ لِأَهْلِ الْمَدِينَةِ the, Ibn Abbas, he said that uh, the Prophet sallallahu set different Miqats, and he said for the people of Medina, ذَلْحُلَيْفَ and for the people of Sham, Wali Ahl Sham al Juhfa, Wali Ahl Najd, and for the people of Najd, Qan al Manazil, Wali Ahl Yemen, Yalamlam, and for the people of Yemen, Yalamlam, Hunna la Hunna, they are for those people, Wali Man Atta Alay Hidna, and for those who travel to them, Mun Ghaydi Hinna, Mimman Arad al Hajj, Wal Umrah, who travel to them, okay, from other places who intend Hajj or Umrah, Waman Kana Duna Dalik, and whoever is, um, within those Miqat boundaries, then he does the Hajj from, where, from wherever he is, uh, to the extent that the people of Mecca, they just get into the Ihram wherever they are in Mecca. So again, just a summary, in order for your Hajj or your Umrah to be valid, you have to enter into the state of Ihram before passing those Miqat. Okay, once you get to the Miqat, you have to enter into the state of Ihram. And generally, today, whenever you travel by a plane or you travel by boat, the people of the plane or the boat, they will tell you in advance, maybe 15 minutes, give you notice that you are going to soon approach the Miqat. Okay, so it's not a difficult thing to find out, inshallah, uh, when you are approaching the Miqat. 
The author he says, وَمَنْ حَجَّ مِنْ أَهْلِ مَكَّةَ فَمِنْهَا Whoever makes Hajj from Mecca, then he can make his Ihram from anywhere in Mecca. وَعُمْرَتُهُ مِنْ الْحِلْمِ However, his Umrah would be done from the hill. So who are the people of Mecca? Who is considered a person of Mecca? هُوَ مَنْ سَكَنَ مَكَّةَ who, It is a person who is a resident in Mecca. وَكَانَ فِيهَا وَلَوْ مِنْ غَيْرِ أَهْلِهَا Even if he's not from its people, meaning he's a foreigner, but he's in Mecca the whole of the year. Okay, he's not traveling. فَهَاُولَاءِ حُكْمُهُمْ بِنِسْبَةِ لِلْحَجْ يَحْرُمُونَ مِنْ أَمْكَانِهِمْ مِنْ أَمَاكِنِهِمْ So these people, with regards to Hajj, who are resident in Mecca, they don't travel in the winter or the summer, uh, then these people, they will make ihram for Hajj or Umrah from wherever they are in Mecca. The hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that we just mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim, وَمَنْ كَانَ دُونَ ذَلِكَ مِنْ حَيْثُ أَنْشَأَ حَتَّى أَحْلُ مَكَّةً مِنْ مَكَّةً as for the Umrah, Sheikh Mansour says, The one who is a, um, a resident in Mecca, he has to go to a place known as Al-Hil to make Ihram. So he goes to Al-Hil, for example, Tan'im, or Al-Arafah, he goes to Tan'im, Masjid Aisha, and he makes, he, he gets into the state of Ihram. If you are a person who is in Mecca for Hajj, you can make the Ihram from wherever you are. But if you're going to do Umrah, then you have to leave the boundaries and go to Tan'im and make um, Ihram in that place. And the illa, as mentioned by Sheikh Mansour, he said, uh, If it was permissible for the people of Mecca to make the Ihram from, um, in Mecca, in the Haram, for Umrah, لَأَذِنَ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم لِعَائِشَ حِينَ أَرَادَتَ الْعُمْرَةَ then the Prophet وسلم, would have given permission to Aisha radiallahu anha when she wanted to make Umrah and tahrum min Mecca. He would have given her permission to get into the state of Ihram from Mecca. Because it was difficult for her and her brother to go to the places of Al-Hil, like Tana'im in the night, yet the Prophet وسلم, uh, didn't give her permission to do it in Mecca. He said, you still have to go to Al-Hil and you have to make ihram there. So this proves that it's imperative to go to al-hil to get into the state of ihram. And the hadith is in Bukhari Muslim. The author now, after having spoken about the mawaqid, the miqat al-makaniya, the miqat which is makaniya, a miqat of place, right? He's now going to speak about the miqat as a maniya, the miqat which is in, in terms of time frame. What are the time frames of making hajj? The author, he says, وَأَشْرُ الْحَجْ شَوَالِ The months of Hajj are Shawwal. وَذُو الْقَعْدَ And ذُو الْقَعْدَ, the month of ذُو الْقَعْدَ, you can say ذُو الْقَعْدَ, which is more uh, appropriate, or more, uh, a better way to say it, or you can say ذُو الْقَعْدَ, with a kasra. So, uh, Shawwal, or ذُو الْقَعْدَ, وَأَشْرُ مِنْ ذِي الْحَجَّةِ And the 10 days of ذِي الْحَجَّةِ. Okay? Uh, the evidence for this is what Ibn Masud and Radiallahu Anhuma, what Ibn Umar, what Ibn Abbas, what Ibn Zubair, all of these companions Radiallahu Anhum, the narrated that the Prophet Sallallahu said, Qalu Ashrul Hajj Shawwal, or it was their opinion that they said Ashrul Hajj Shawwal, that the, the month of Shawwal, the month the months of Hajj are Shawwal, or Dhul Ka'da, and Dhul Ka'da and the 10 days of Dhul Hajjah. And this narration is found by, a, is being brought by Imam Tabarani in Al-Awsat and Ibn Abi Shayba and Dara Qutni and Imam Al-Hakim in his Mustadrak who said it's authentic and Al-Bayhaqi and Al-Kubra and also who said it's authentic. It was uh, Ibn Hajj in Al-Fatih and Imam Al-Nawi rahmatullah alayhima in Al-Majmu'ah. We will stop here, inshallah, before moving on to Bab al-Haram, uh, giving us time to review what we've taken. If there are any questions or clarifications what I've mentioned, then feel free. Wa jazakumullahu khayrah.